Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's 2 p.m. Central European time, 2 p.m. here in Lund. Uh, we're just starting this session, uh, which is we, we started something called Applicant Week. Applicant Week for prospective students who are intending to apply to an international degree program at Lund University uh, with thematic sessions. And today, uh, it's the turn of business economics and management. So in the morning, we had a session with uh, a selection of programs, but we have a lot of programs in, in business and economics and management. So we've divided it into two sessions. And this is the afternoon session. We have uh, program representatives from several uh, of our uh, international degree programs in, in Lund, Lund University School of Economics and Management. I just want to start uh, say now at the beginning of this session that we have a Q&A function open. Uh, so I would like uh, to invite our participants to use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions, preferably uh, directed to the, to the programs that we have here today, of course, uh, to make it extra interesting. So please do not uh, be shy at any point to use the Q&A to ask a question about uh, the programs that are represented here today from the School of Economics and Management at Lund University. But uh, since we just have a one hour session, time flies, I would like to not waste too much of your time. And uh, I would like to ask the program representatives to introduce themselves and the programs that they work with here in Lund. And I'm going to start with Ulf Rambay. Thank you, Johan. Hi, my name is Ulf Rambay, and I'm the program director for our master program in, in international strategic management here at our School of Economics and Management. Thank you, Ulf. Next up is Niklas Andrea. Hi, my name is Niklas Andrea, and uh, I'm actually the former uh, director of the accounting and finance program. I uh, handed over the uh, directorship uh, this last summer, but the director couldn't be here, so I'm sort of a stand-in today. A wonderful stand-in. <laughs> wonderful stand-in. And you've been here before in this particular session, so you're, yes, you're used to it. Okay, so thank you very much. And then we have Nadja Soryade from management. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Nadia Soriade, and uh, I'm course responsible for uh, the first course on the Master in Management program. And I'm also a uh, stand in for the program manager, but uh, I'm taking part in various uh, uh, courses at this program. So I feel fine in uh, answering uh, your questions about the program too. Thank you, Nadja. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Craig Mitchell from Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Welcome, Craig. Hey, thanks. Uh, hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may find yourself in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Craig Mitchell, and I'm program responsible for the Master's Programme in Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, I can also tell you a little secret. Um, I'm also an alumni of the programme. I'm a former graduate of the programme many, many years ago. So I can... Um, perhaps come with different perspectives, maybe, as a student and as program director. All right. Thank you, Craig. That's interesting. I didn't know that, or <laughs> but now we do. So uh, I just want to kick off this session with a question on my uh, of my own, because I know that a lot of students are wondering, they look at our program portfolio and they, find, they know they want to study management. So they see we have a program, a master's in management, and then we also have one in, in international strategic management. So Ulf and Nadja, how would you describe the, the main difference between these two programs that are both kind of management degrees, but different? Uh, Ulf, what, what would you say? Uh, if I can start, I can start the, the boring way with uh, some formalities uh, to, to, to reach out to our program. Uh, you need um, 60 credits of business administration. So that's one formal uh, stuff that you really need to, to cover up. And mm -hmm. for you, Nadia, it's something else. I guess. Yeah, it's different. So we're looking for a diversity of students. So uh, those of you who have not studied management and who are interested in still taking a, a master in management. Yes. Right. But what about, is it, would it lead to similar types of careers, would you say, uh, these two programs, perhaps? Yeah, uh, for those who are taking the master in management, they, they come with a bachelor of some sort and uh, the usual 
proceeding way then is to continue with a new field, but then that you're ready for a management position within that field. So for instance, if you studied engineering, you might want to work as a manager project leader uh, in that type of industry. Right, uh, what about your program? Yeah, and about the strategy program, I would say it's, it's, it's in fact, if you're interested in strategy, if you're interested in management, if you're interested in this kind of international business setting, this is one one interesting program for you. And and I guess it's it's more about deepen the knowledge, but also to work really, really near uh, the idea of practice and the cases and that kind of stuff. So so it's a, it's quite demanding program, I would say. Uh, we have lots of ambitious students applying for the program, so so it. Yeah, uh, it, it's about deepening your knowledge in strategy and management and, and the international business setting, I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, it's interesting. You, yeah, Nadia, please Yeah, I'm sorry, I can just, about the content, I would say it's also different. You're, some, you're in a bit also, Ulf, on um, master uh, in management, but yeah. the idea on this program is definitely that it's kind of beyond reading about, it's a lot about practice. So we, uh, for instance, set, so the whole idea is that you're supposed to uh, develop your skills as a project leader and also as a team member. So it's a lot about practice and we put together diverse teams and also encourage students to both read and to work in those teams throughout the program in order, order to in practice develop management skills. And uh, I think we also, we work a lot with cases just as you do, Ulf, uh, on your program, but we kind of have the intention to take that, the practice one step further in this program. All right, thank you. Uh, Craig, um, if we turn to your program, Entrepreneurship and Innovation, what you have in common with the management program is that you do not require a business administration study background, do you? I mean, you can you can join your program or a student can join your program with a degree in more or less anything. Uh, exactly. And, and we, what we really like to champion is a really diverse group of students, both in terms of um, different parameters, but definitely in terms of their academic experience, what they've studied before. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you an example of the, the current class. We have um, a medical doctor, a fashion designer, and a paramedic all taking the program at the moment. So we're an extremely diverse group. Okay. Uh, Niklas, if we turn to accounting and finance, you're, you're, I wouldn't say the opposite in that regard, but you have a very uh, strict, uh, one might say, entry requirements to join the accounting and finance program. Students need, isn't it 90 ECTS or the equivalent of 90 ECTS of business uh, studies before they can have a chance to join, be selected? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we are in a sense the opposite uh, in, in that sense. This is a specialist program. Uh, if you're if you have a strong interest and a study background in corporate finance or in primarily management accounting, but accounting generally will suffice, then you would be eligible for this program. But you need a background not only in, in business administration in general, but you also need a specialization in either corporate finance or management accounting. Okay. Thank you. So, but, but one thing all of these four uh, programs have in common is the fact that they're one, one year programs, one year master's programs. And we sometimes, I want to preempt perhaps a, a potential question that might come in. What, why are the programs just one year in duration? Because we, a lot of people expect that master's degree programs are usually two years in duration. Who would like to take that question? No one. <laughs> it's a tricky one to answer. <laughs> but uh, we, we do get that question. Yeah. Uh, why is the program? Is it more intense, is, or is it designed more for students who are eager to, uh, you know, finish their studies and and join uh, like a private sector company or uh, work, basically? I think. It just taking it from the accounting and finance program point of view, I think uh, one year is enough considering the kind of uh, careers our students are aiming for. Uh, so I think, yes, it's an intense program. We're not trying to squeeze in two years into one year, but it is an intense program. Um, 
it's probably higher paced than many two-year programs would be. Uh, but I do think it's enough for the kinds of careers that students are aiming for. What about the kind of employer perspective? Are, are future employers, are they looking at, oh, this is just a one-year degree and this guy has a two-year degree? Is there a difference there in your kind of experience or opinions? I've never heard that. To be mm. honest. The only no. time I think it really matters if you is if you want to do research. If you want okay. to go on doing research, then there may be an advantage in having a two-year degree. But uh, no, not professionally. I've never heard any, anyone saying that, actually. Okay, well, thank you. So we have uh, just a couple of questions that come in so far. Uh, I want to ask about international management. So Ulf, Victoria is asking, for international management, what profile should I bring to have a chance to get a seat in the program? What are the decision criteria, the selection criteria to choose students for the program? And how competitive is it? I would say it's really a competitive program. We are ranked at the Financial Times uh, ranking of uh, management, masters in management. Um, I would say uh, make yourself visible in, in your statement of purpose. Do not use this kind of standardized uh, statement of purpose. Make your visible, make it personal, make it reflect both on who you are and, and on, on the content of the program. Uh, and then, of course, if you have a strong CV, that's that's also uh, helps a lot. But but uh, grades and how you how you argument to 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 get a, a place on the program that that I would say is really really important. So the statement of purpose is the 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 applicant's opportunity to really get noticed by you guys. Yeah, at least for me. And I hate, I, sorry, I can't, maybe I should not use that kind of word, but I, it's much more interesting to read something personal reflection about yourself and why you want to, to head to, to Lund for, for, for different kind of programs, for sure. All right, thank you. Craig, would you like to add something? Yeah, I just want to add upon what, or echo what Ulf said as well. I mean, we, we only look for tailored statement of purposes. Yeah. And I'm not speaking about my program specific, but, um, one thing that we can see as program directors, we can see what other programs at the school you've applied for also. So sometimes if we check your statement of purpose and you've sent the same one to entrepreneurship as you sent to um, strategic management, and, and we can actually see that. Right. So lots of yeah. secrets here, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's good feedback because we do see that many students tend to apply to several programs because we have many attractive programs. And it's quite natural, in my opinion, that students would like to maybe one or two, sometimes even four different programs all at the School of Economics and Management that they, they apply to. So that's great advice. But what would you say, Craig, then if you do apply to more than one program, let's say you apply to entrepreneur and you also apply to management, how do you, because you have kind of similar templates for, for the statement of purpose, don't you? So first of all, we, we would love if you applied for multiple programs. That's That's not to discourage that, but just make sure the statements of purpose are tailored to each specific program. And um, the statement of purposes may look similar, but if you look closer at the questions, they're they are much more specific to the current programs. Um, for our program in entrepreneurship and innovation, we are really looking in the statement of purpose that a candidate has taken action, has done something, has taken initiative. They've been part of a startup, they have done an intern at startup, or they've just been engaged in student unions or student organizations so we we really look for this action orientation in our in our candidates so you're not strictly looking at the the grades or the courses that they took uh, for their bachelors uh... Uh, absolutely grades do play a, a crucial role in our evaluations also but we on the more softer side we definitely look for candidates who have shown initiative and done stuff and taken action Mm -hmm. Nadja, uh, what about management, masters in management? Yes, I thought it would be a good idea to also clarify that. Um, 
just as both Ulf and, and Craig said, um, it's about being personal here too. And uh, we're not, of course, we're looking at the CV, but the CV is not the key part. So it's not what you have done. We want you to really look into the future and tell us why you would like to go this program. So the program is really focused on your development. And I would say kind of a program that's really encouraging uh, a growth mindset so that you personally are really interested in growing. And that's why we also would like to hear about your kind of intentions with the program, why you would like to do it, and what do you think that the program can give you? Right. So it's uh, the applicant will, they will need to do their homework before they make an application and really look at, for example, the courses and the modules that we will provide in the program so that they truly understand what it is or have come in with the right expectations, basically. Yeah, and I mean, when it comes to management, if you then study then something else, maybe, uh, I don't know, we also have a broad variety. I mean, it could be engineering, as I said, it could also be art, architecture, or something else. Uh, then it's like, why do you want to focus now on management? What is it with management that you would like to, to do and develop uh, personally? Yeah. Mm, thank you. Niklas, accounting and finance, what do you look at uh, when they apply? Well, since accounting and finance is more of a specialist program, uh, the statement of purpose is of slightly less importance uh, to us. Grades matter, certainly matter more. Um, the uh, statement of purpose is more factual than anything. Uh, so it's a, it's a perfect place to uh, clarify what you have studied before. For example, if you've been uh, on the study exchange uh, that's a perfect place to to emphasize that. So we are more factual. Uh, okay. We're looking for very good students, but focus on grades. A, a related question: How important is the ranking or perceived quality of the home university? Well, I can begin. Uh, uh, it, it matters to some extent. Uh, it's not the key parameter, but it certainly matters. It matters in the sense that if you have good grades from a high quality student, for a high quality university, it does say something about the environment you've been studying in. Uh, you come from a more competitive background. You, uh, well, it took more to, to enter that university. So that's primarily at least how we interpret it um, when we do admissions in accounting and finance. Mm -hmm. What about you other uh, representatives? Do you take this into consideration? Uh, the, I mean, it's difficult sometimes to rate or <laughs> uh, there are, I don't know if there are 17,000 universities around the world or something like that. It's, it's, it's not so easy to, to know in great detail everything about these universities, but we also have an idea, right? We, we, we know about certain universities, we have heard of them, they appear in the international ranking list, etc. Ulf, Craig and Nadja, is this something? Yeah, Craig? Yeah, so I, I can add, I mean, we also have a really rigorous process when we do the university ranking. I think I saw Tova on the call, who's a program administrator for many of the programs represented today, and uh, she does a really good job in being really stringent and rigorous in the, the ranking of uh, previous studies at university. And a little bit like Nicholas touched on, we, we look at it as a sort of a levelling parameter with the argument being probably it's tougher to get an A at a really highly ranked university than it is to have an A at a lower ranked university. However, on the entrepreneurship programme in particular, we have reduced the importance of the university ranking somewhat uh, to what somewhat some we've had in, in previous years. And I can say one result of that is I think we've had a much more diverse group of people um, in the program in the end. But it still is very important. Yeah. Ulf and Nadja, would you like to add anything to this? I agree. We do the same. They, they're all, they're, we weigh that in, of course. But, but um, the, the important stuff is you, I would say, and how you, for my program at least, articulate your statement of purpose and done your credits in, in business administration. Right, so so students who do not perhaps come from the very the elite university in their own home country should not be discouraged 
to try to make an no, application? No. Absolutely not. No, absolutely no way. not. Right. But then there is something else here, competition to, to get a seat in a program, because all of these programs that are represented here today get hun literally hundreds and even more than a thousand applicants uh, every, uh, uh, every year. And so we have to make a selection, right? Uh, we have to select because many qualified applicants, all of them cannot get a seat in the program. So how how do you, how can we select students? You've touched upon like grades and and the importance of the statement of purpose, but it's still quite competitive, right? Is there anything else you would like? Some insight? Uh, no insight. Craig shakes his head. I, I mean, mean I, we could accept several hundred <laughs> of students to the program if we could, but unfortunately, we cannot. Uh, but is there anything else? Because you said you have more diversity these days, Craig. Uh, is How important is that for, the, for your particular program? I mean, that we have people coming from all continents, many different countries around the world, which we often tell, look, we're a very international university, but in reality, how international are we and you? I mean, of course, it's not it's not something that, that is a criteria on our application process, but how it turns out is we I diverse on a number of different parameters. I mean, the current class were 28 different nationalities from 66 people. Mm. Uh, I mentioned before their academic background. Um, as I said, we have a fashion designer, a doctor, a paramedic architect. We have a, a aerospace engineer also. So we are an extremely diverse group when it comes to nationality, um, previous experience. But I can see in the chat also there was a question about age. Mm -hmm. We're also quite diverse when it comes to age. We have students who have just completed their bachelor's, so students who are 20, 21, but we also have people who are returning to, to their studies after a couple of decades. Um, we have a student this year who's 45 years old, and we've had older in the past also. So age is definitely um, nothing to put older candidates off applying. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, because we often get that question uh, quite often, because in, in I, I guess in certain countries or cultures, it's you're not supposed to study after a certain age, perhaps, and then they feel that we might discriminate against them if they make an application. But that's that's not the case uh, at all. But uh, with age comes also experience, right? So in many cases, people or students who are slightly older, more mature, they also have work experience. And how important is that for your respective programs that they have seen, you know, real life uh, and have experience from outside of academia? They've been working four or five, six years, perhaps, in different positions or how important is that for your program, Ulf, uh, that they have this? I give it importance, uh, especially if they relate it to their statement of purpose so, and why they did the, the, the choices that they have done during during their different kind of employments. Uh, of course, it's important. It's it's not so very good, I would say, and, and uh, clever to send in a, a blank CV. Fill it with everything. Uh, and as Craig was saying, it's about what kind of action have you done? What kind of experience can you bring into class? And the more experience you have in the class, the better is the discussion and the learning climate. So it's very crucial, I would say. Mm -hmm. Nadja, what would you say for the, the management program? Is, is work experience a bonus? I, I would assume so, but I, I don't know. So I'm asking you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can say right away, I'm not working with, um, I don't have specific details about uh, when we apply, how that process is going since I'm, I'm teaching on the program. But what I can say in general and stress in general about this program is that it's about developing yourself. So this is definitely not a program where you come and expect to go through rather quickly and individually. Uh, and kind of examine and tick tick off. It's a lot about whether you're interested in in developing yourself, and with that also challenge yourself. And you also need to show that you're interested in that. And the, the second thing that I'm also thinking that in these things could be related to experience in in the sense that if you might consider yourself more finished than others, then that could be a problem. But so it's it's more about your, uh, your idea of what you would like to do. Since also you're going to be put together in a team which you're going to work with 
throughout uh, the whole year. And it's a lot of interaction. So it's nothing at all staying at home, working on your own. So as long as you're interested in being a team member and also developing your skills as a team member, you're really welcome to this program. Right. Uh, Niklas, I would ask you, but I actually have a question here directed to, to you uh, for the accounting and finance program has two specializations, management accounting and corporate finance. If I am right, there's also a separate finance master program. Yeah, that's correct. What is the difference between these programs uh, or this program and the corporate finance specialization? So we have a, a pure program in finance, master's degree in finance, and we also have this uh, corporate finance specialization within your program. So what can you explain the difference? Yeah, I think so. Um, the finance, pure finance program is uh, more analytical. Uh, they work more with the uh, econometric uh, methods, more with data analysis. It's more market oriented. Uh, so the workings of financial markets, the pricing of financial securities, whereas the corporate finance specialization on the accounting and finance masters is oriented towards specifically corporate financial challenges of various kinds. So corporate financing, uh, corporate financial strategies, corporate valuation, corporate credit ratings. Uh, so it, there is a fairly clear distinction between them uh, once you're on the program. Uh, corporate finance has a much clearer emphasis on applications within firms. All right. Fairly short answer. Thank you, Niklas. I hope that makes sense to you, Jorik. Um, we have a question here that perhaps more general, but I think it's interesting uh, for students to learn about the, the classroom environment that we have uh, at Lund University in general, but specifically at the L Faculty of uh, Economics and Management. So Olivia is asking, I would like to know what the learning environment in the classroom is like, and what are the characteristics of students that uh, the committee is looking for? Well, we don't have a committee exactly, but uh, the, the, the people who would admit you, what are they looking for in their applicants? But what's the classroom environment like? What, what, what happens in class at Lund University? Uh, Craig, as a former student yourself, uh, what was it like? What do you do in class? What was it like or what is it like? Yeah, <laughs> both. Is there a so huge the, difference? So the, between... bu the, bu the building is the same. Yeah. Um, the physical spaces are the same, but the way that they have been uh, furnished and arranged and the inclusion of technology is much different. So today, I think we have quite a modern campus and uh, we have larger lecture halls and we have smaller so-called flipped classrooms um, with a lot of technology, including projectors and sockets for your smartphones and your laptops and things like that. And these rooms are really designed to be quite interactive. So these rooms are used not for standard lecturing, but perhaps smaller seminars or workshops or flipped approaches. Um, but the school also has a large number of open spaces, we have quite um, large halls where the different um, courses or the student union organize events. Um, the school also has a really, as far as I'm concerned, um, modern, welcoming, and open um, learning hub, basically study spaces. Um, the study spaces we have at the school, I think, are are almost second to none. It's quite um, extensive, this, the spaces that students have to work in their groups or find a quiet place to study. Uh, really modern, really open, really bright. Right. So what about more like the learning, the teaching style, perhaps we might say? Uh, what we usually say Sweden is quite non-hierarchical and there's a kind of a, a pretty flat organization. Uh, so so for academic staff and, and uh, students are more on an even kind of, not quite colleagues perhaps, but there is uh, certainly a, a rather informal relationship sometimes. Uh, Ulf, what, what would you say to that? Uh, what can students expect? Yeah, you know, I think you touch on something very important that relating to to the learning environment in in the classroom uh, yes we are uh, you can send an email to your professor and he or she will answer it quite quickly you can also ask a question and we really want these kind of discussions and dialogue during our lecturing so so it's it's really open warm as as craig is, has mentioned 
uh, learning climate and we try to encourage that kind of friendly learning environment uh, between yeah with different kind of uh, methods and, and and that kind of stuff so we yeah it's a friendly one uh, warm but also I would say depending on your input sometimes more than the input output input from 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 um, the, the 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 guy or, or person that is doing the lecture I would say I'm not sure if you agree, Nadia, because we really encourage students to yeah. get engaged uh, during the class. Yes, we definitely do. And I can also just agree. I mean, we're on first name basis and uh, you can just reach out when there is a thing and something you're wondering about. And also we encourage, I would say, we encourage discussions. And also at the main program, we work a lot with the flipped classroom mythology in the sense that there can be pre-recorded lectures. So you're supposed to come to class prepared uh, and then there is a lot of interactive dimensions where you discuss in groups and also in the large class. Um, yeah, so really interactive, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I'm thinking that is very interactive and, and students are expected to participate actively in discussions and, and, and uh, etc. So that would, in my mind, mean that students who are confident in their language English language proficiency are that is how important is that Niklas I mean that students come in and they are able to communicate freely with uh, everyone around faculty members and also classmates how much tremendously important mm -hmm. it's, it's essential I would say uh, on all programs I think I speak for everyone here it's very very important to be good at English uh, whether you have flipped classes or very interactive classes or just standard lecture-based classes, it, knowledge of English is certainly very, very important. There's no doubt about it. Mm. Right. We had this, I remember a year ago, we had a colleague of Nadja's uh, for the management program, and he stressed the importance of being able to communicate well, uh, both, I mean, orally, but also in writing, of course, because uh, you need to write a lot. Um, Craig, here are a couple of questions uh, directed to you uh, from Sasha. Uh, I, I hope you know what uh, this person is asking about, because it's about the mentorship program. What does the mentorship program oh. look like in detail? Who are these mentors? Is there a process uh, to how we get connected with the mentors? Yep, um, really good question, Sasha. And I also noticed that you asked a previously good question as well. So maybe I take both in one. But the, sure. the mentorship program is something that I'm really proud of in the program. Basically, our mentors are uh, former alumni or people who are who are entrepreneurs who started companies before, or they may be leaders of industry or hold some sort of leadership or management position within a company. What we do, we match each student with their dedicated mentor. Um, the mentor is not to act as a business coach. They're not to coach in any sort of startup advice or anything like that. But what they're there is to mentor the student's personal journey to becoming an entrepreneur. That's that, that's kind of tough. I mean, there's team breakups. You fall in love with your idea. You fall out of love with your idea. So the mentors are really there um, to help support you. I say our mentors are a shoulder to cry on, an ear to listen, and a hand to high five, basically. So how do you how 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 are mentors and students uh, put, put together? I mean, it's yeah. is there so a the, process for that? There's a process, yeah. Um, so the the matching happens halfway through the first semester. Uh, previous to that, there's lots of um, social events, lots of speed meeting, lots of um, sharing of presentations between the students and the mentors because we want to find students and mentors who match on a personal level, that there's some sort of chemistry there. Because basically you you need to trust your mentor, you are going to tell them what's happening with your life, what's happening with your startup. So we really want the trust to be there. So there's the whole process of getting to know each other over a sort of five to six week period before we match the students and the mentors. Okay, good. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, or sorry, Craig, it was well, a question from Sasha. You can also touch on Sasha the question about what is experiential learning. Certainly. Um, so experiential learning basically in the entrepreneurship program is during the, the course of the year, you try to start a startup. So you take action. That's the experiential learning part. 
but we do couple that with theory, of course, theories and models that you can use to implement in your startup projects. But we're also um, champions of reflection. So it's not enough to go out and do stuff using theory, but we also demand that students use reflection to reflect upon how they did, why they did it, and how they might approach the same situation again. So that's our three pillars of our pedagogical approach, action, theory, and reflection. All right. Thank you, Craig. So that was Sasha's two questions. We have another question from Laura, who is interested in uh, the master's in management. And uh, this person uh, graduated with degree in humanities. However, I have a minor in human resource management. Will that affect me as a candidate? Am I still eligible to apply for the master's in management? As I am aware, you cannot apply with a business major, but I'm unsure about having a business minor. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a bit too detailed for me since <laughs> um, I don't work with it. But for me, it doesn't sound like a problem. But um, I guess if you really would like to make sure you should contact the, the program director, Ola Matteson. But I don't, for me, it doesn't sound like an issue. No. No, I think, I mean, in theory, at least if, if this person has enough credits in business studies, business administration, then perhaps international strategic management might be an option. Uh, but there is, I think, I, I, I believe I've read somewhere that if you have over a certain number of credits previously in business administration, you're not eligible for the master's in management. Yeah. But you need enough credits in business administration to be eligible for the international strategic management. So I think, uh, uh, Laura, maybe you need to go home and have a look at your transcript and see how many credits exactly you have in, in these uh, so-called majors before you decide. Uh, yeah. So Sasha is back asking about the international master's class. If, is there anyone here who is uh, comfortable speaking about the international master's class? Because this opportunity exists for many programs. Uh, Ulf, you're nodding, and Craig as well. Uh, the... well. Yeah, I can start, Craig. Uh, yes, that's something that you can um, set in an application in, in January, February, and, and, and you can do that after the program. We also have summer classes uh, that you can apply in the same time of, of the year January February and we have a I'm not sure but I think we have at least more than 100 partner universities around the world so you can be all over the place uh, if you want so so please that's a really a golden opportunity I would say in my program we also have this uh, idea of double degree uh, for with the Deakin University and that's also something that you apply during January February when when you are on the program and that's something that you do then in the autumn after after the summer break okay so there yeah. are lots of opportunities to 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 go even deeper into your education so if we have one year here in sweden in our program you can expand it and more and and this master class is also part of your exam from the university all right craig did you want to add something to that yeah i, I don't have statistics but i've got some anecdotal points um so each year we have a handful of students from the program who who are successful in, yeah. in their application for the masterclass. Um, it really does depend on, as you say, Sasha, on your question, exceptional results. So to be um, considered, you really do have to have higher grades than your, than your classmates. Mm. All right. But this is something that the, the, the opportunity to apply for this, uh, it, it will uh, appear when they have already started and learned. So it's not something that they would need to yeah. apply to before they come, uh, of course. So, yeah. right. So I have a question for Niklas. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I totally understand it, but I think you m might understand it when I read it to you, Niklas. Could it happen that one may apply for the management control specialization, but will be granted admission to the corporate finance specialization instead because of your assessment of their statement of purpose? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, Can't you, happen. You can only be admitted to the, uh, the specialization you applied for. Okay, so already in the application, at the application stage, you need to choose or select yes. one of these two. Yes. So it's never possible to apply to both. No. And we're not allowed to move applicants between the two specializations. Right, Lydia. So listen to Nicholas. You better be certain about the specialization you choose when you apply to the program. Yep. Thank you. Uh, here's another question for management. 
So uh, Nadja, perhaps, my interest is in management. What are the criteria for one to obtain a seat in the management program? How, what is the selection criteria? Nadja, are you? Yeah, I mean, we have the formal requirements for uh, your background, how many uh, points you need to have taken uh, and which are in general. But then I just talked about what we can have a look for in applicants. Uh, that you are really interested in this type of program. So I again would like to stress that it's a different type of uh, program in the sense that it's about developing yourself. Uh, but as I said, I'm really sorry, I can't go into details about um, the application program. I can more tell you about uh, the program as such, what it's, it's about and what type of people we're looking for. Mm. But uh, I mean, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to point out to all uh, people who are here today that we have selection, all our programs have selection criteria that they have decided themselves. And these are published on the web pages of the programs that you are considering. So you see the entry requirements first, and these must be met in full. But then below that, you will see selection criteria. And that tells you how the, the programs select students based on what exactly. So that can be very helpful. Ulf. Yeah, and please make sure that you send in all documents needed. Yeah, good point. Do not uh, omit anything or forget to uh, make a complete application. Yeah. Uh, February 1st is the deadline uh, for you to complete your application. Um, we have a question here. I think maybe Niklas, uh, because it's about accounting, I believe. Uh, a person is asking, I'm interested in the program that leads to a fast track ACCA qualification. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, it's some, some kind of accredited. Uh, it's an accounting accreditation, yes. Accounting accreditation, thank you. <laughs> Do graduates of your program, uh, accounting and finance, qualify for exemption or, and if yes, how many papers? No, it doesn't. Uh, we are not collaborating with, uh, with ACCA, uh, so. Uh, you may apply for an exemption, but you have to apply directly to ACCA for it. Uh, but we do not have uh, a collaboration with ACCA, so there is there is no automatic exemption. Okay. So this is because we do get this question: Do you, uh, if you complete your program, do you automatically become a, a qualified uh, to to work as a accountant in Sweden, uh, for instance? Yeah, no, you don't. Uh, yeah. this, this is an international accountant qualification. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of accounting programs where uh, you can directly translate a course on the program into one of the, as they call it, papers or courses within, within ACA, uh, thereby get an exemption from the requirements for the ACA degree or uh, ACA qualification. But that's not the case for the accounting and finance program. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we have a question here that I find pretty interesting. Uh, the grading system that you use in the programs for, for courses that have been successfully, or <laughs> not successfully completed, but hopefully successfully completed, how are students graded? Is it A, B, C, or what kind of grading system do you use Craig in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation do you are you comfortable talking about that yep I'm um, having just finished the grading for one course I'm completely comfortable with that um yeah so some assignments are graded a to f a being the highest and f being a fail and um, but other assignments are simply graded in pass or fail Okay, but what's the difference? Why are there like A to F in some courses, but only pass or fail for other? Do you know? Um, it's each each course will have um at least in our master program will have at least one assignment which is graded A to F, mm -hmm. and then perhaps one or two smaller assignments which are um, graded as pass or fail. Okay, what about the other programs? Uh, Nadia, you you teach. How do you grade your students? 
Yeah, we also have the regular A to F scale, uh, but then there are also um, some assignments that you only get a pass fail, and also um, the course or the part where you work in groups and develop your groups, that's all also only uh, pass or fail, because it's about reflecting upon your development and um, and also you have teamwork and leadership sessions where you go out and uh, learn about teamwork and also reflect upon that and those are not things that it's more about reflection and that you're supposed to learn and it's less about getting a exact grade on that so it's a pass fail part okay but and also I saw a question about like whether we have a certain amount of a and b's and c's and we yeah. don't so it's like uh, up to your performance. And if you perform at a certain level, you will get that grade. So if, if I can connect this uh, to something that we mentioned previously, that is the international uh, masterclass, would higher grades on courses be beneficial for a student who would like to join an international masterclass? Uh, yes, there, I see nodding heads. Uh, Niklas. <laughs> yes. Yes, certainly. Uh, the international master's class is based on uh, your grades on the first semester of courses, or the courses during the first semester. And generally, when it comes to grading, we have a requirement that the school, uh, that generally courses should be graded A through F. Uh, so it's it would certainly be an exemption if you have a course that is only graded pass fail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ulf? And when we use this idea of pause and fail, we, we, we try at least to work with the learning environment uh, to get connected to this idea of a more a formative approach to learning uh, than just at the end of the course have this kind of graded uh, exam. So it's we use them as keeping the pace of, of learning on, on a, a certain level, I would say. So it's a more formative approach, this pause and fail, than, than, than just heading for the final uh, grade on on the course and i think that is important all right thank you craig yeah and just in case it, it wasn't obvious i mean in almost all courses you're graded both on your individual performance but there's also graded on group work also yeah and that's good that that is something that i would like to speak about a bit because group work is is, is seen as a very typical feature of uh, higher education in sweden I'm sure they use it in other countries as well, but when when you when you talk about higher education in Sweden, group work always comes up as a discussion point. I would say, how do how do we use group work here, and what does it mean exactly, uh, Nadia? Uh, how do you mean we work? Uh, I mean, we work in various ways in teams. Mm. So, I mean, one thing could be that you prepare for a classroom discussion. It could also mean in the classroom that you then discuss and work um, together in a group of people to solve a task. Uh, but I think uh, on this program, we really want to take the, the teamwork experience to another level. So you will then be signed into your base team. So a team of um, five people with a really diverse background, both when it comes to ethnicity and also um, formal background, your study background. Uh, and also uh, age and, and gender. So, and then you're supposed to work and collaborate together and uh, to solve various types of uh, problems. And it's often related to cases. And we work, for instance, a lot with live cases. And the whole idea with, uh, just to add with uh, the pass fail part, there is this dimension of also learning and reflecting upon how that work is going within your team and developing you there. So we put, I would say, it's not that you're thrown out to work in teams. We also want to develop your skills and abilities to collaborate in a team. And we'll do that by support of both the lectures, um, workshops and also tutorials so you will get a tutor that's supporting your group work throughout the year mm -hmm. thank you Ulf. and just to, to add on that uh, nadia i would say use the, the use of group work is, is also a, a learning approach i would say where when we think that the learning is in the dialogue between students uh, not always just in the dialogue between the, the lecturer and the students. Lots of learning is going on when students are discussing different kinds of topics during the program. Hmm. Yes, definitely. Craig? Yeah, I, I want to mention that 
for the entrepreneurship program that teamwork is is crucial and um, ultimately you will work in your startup teams and um, these teams are formed in october and ideally you stay part of the same team all the way to to the end of the program in june so even including for the final thesis or uh... Yeah, so that's separate. In the spring semester, we have two parallel courses. We have a course called the Entrepreneurial Project, where you work in your startup team. But in addition to that, we have the thesis course, where you work in a, a different constellation with one other person. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, writing a thesis is something that we are used to here in Sweden. You have to do uh, when you uh, when you study, but not that's not often uh, or always the case in other countries. Uh, is it important for you that students have produced uh, a, a thesis as part of their bachelor's degree, Niklas? Is that something that you place important importance on uh, when you? Uh, well, no. Technically, there I think students are required, but often we don't know, <laughs> so we can't really say. That would be the very honest answer to that one. Mm. Uh, so, not really. Uh, but it's certainly an advantage when it comes to writing your thesis once you're here, because you're accustomed to writing in that kind of way. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question here for Craig. Uh, Margarita is asking, I'm interested in the program of entrepreneurship and innovation. I'm looking at the template for the statement of purpose, and I've noticed there are four questions. The word limit of 1000 is valid for each question, or is it an overall word count? which means that each answer should be approximately 250 words. Um, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that question, Johan, because the answer is, <laughs> I'm not really sure how. I don't know if to, I tried to find the document secretly, but I wasn't able to find that. Um, I asked Margarita to contact either me or, or Tova, and we can answer that. Yeah, please do. I, I think I, I've seen a few of these templates before, and I think it's pretty clear from the template where, I mean, the instruction to the, but I understand that there can be perhaps uh, sometimes uh, misunderstandings on this. I don't want to answer with the wrong answer, so I'm going to yeah. not answer. Right. Margarita, please contact Craig or one of his colleagues to, to get a good answer to that. Uh, Niklas? I believe it's per question. A thousand words or 250 words? Uh, a thousand characters. A thousand characters. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Including spaces then, I would assume. Yes. yes. So, uh, Niklas, I have a question again. Uh, what is the difference between the corporate finance and the master's in finance? Uh, corporate finance program and the other separate program, the master of science in finance. So you've already answered this, but maybe this was a latecomer, uh, yeah. this person, and didn't catch the answer. Would you mind repeating it, please? Let's hope I'm answering the same thing now. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the finance program, uh, it's, it's a more analytical program. Uh, it's focused more on, on econometrics, financial econometrics. It's focused more on data analytics. It's focused more on financial markets, pricing of financial securities. Whereas the corporate finance specialization has a strong focus on corporate financial decision making. So various aspects of, of corporate finance and corporate financing, financial strategies, corporate financing decisions, corporate valuation, doing credit assessments of firms, uh, corporate restructurings. So it, it, it's a there is a very different focus on the two programs uh, once you're on the program, so to speak. Right. But a student can, in theory, apply to both uh, yes. if they have the right uh, academic background. Yes. Um, I have a question here, which is kind of, I, I, I think it's maybe very difficult to answer uh, here and now, but the, they're asking about like the average GPA of successfully admitted candidates to your programs at last, like last year or previous couple of years. Is that anything you feel comfortable talking about? We, we don't talk about GPA so much here in Sweden when we, there is, for example, no minimum GPA requirement uh, but would you like, does anyone want to say anything about the GPA? Ulf, you look ready to. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready. I, 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 and I can't know, I can't exact say the, 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 the grade here, but, but it's high. Uh, mm. I mean, we, for my program, I have 1,200 applications, 500 in, in first hands applications. And I select at the end uh, around uh, 50 to 60 students. So it's quite tough. And grade is one part of our judgment. The, the, the other part is, of course, your statement of purpose and, and what you have done. 
Right. So it's 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 I would say all of our programs are quite competitive in that sense. Yeah, all of these uh, four represented programs here now are do you have to make a selection among many uh, yeah. eligible uh, candidates uh, yeah. who are applying. So of course GPA uh, plays a part. Uh, but here we have also a question that is, I, I kind of anticipated this, <laughs> that we would get this question. It's about business administration. And what we say, for instance, a student would need the equivalent of 60 credits ECTS in business administration to be eligible or 90 sometimes. Uh, but, but what does that mean? Because some students don't know quite what could be included in, in this what is business administration exactly? Uh, Niklas, you're laughing, so please provide an explanation. It's a fairly Nordic construct, uh, <laughs> Nordic and German construct. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the easiest way to understand is actually to go to the homepage of the Department of Business Administration and see what we do. I think that would be the fastest way of really understanding. Uh, have I studied the same kind of things? Uh, in my home university. But generally speaking, we're talking about uh, subjects such as marketing, management, strategic management, entrepreneurship, uh, accounting, corporate finance, organizational studies. Um, so business administration has to do with the firm, the corporate entity, and various aspects on the corporate entity. Um, but I think going to the homepage of the department would be the the best way to figure out, actually. Yeah, or at least to learn about our kind of definition of business well, administration. I, I mean, the department is fairly standard in that sense as a mm. business administration department. But you don't have too many business administration departments around the world. You find it in the Nordic area. You find it in Germany and a couple of other countries. Uh, so it's a it's a fairly unique co construct, but we have a fairly traditional department in terms of coverage of subdisciplines of what we call business administration. Right, and sixty ECTS, of course, that would be one third of the credits earned at bachelor's level, or at least the equivalence of that. Uh, sixty ECTS, one third of the bachelor's degree in Sweden uh, or in most European countries, I would say. Uh, so that's one way to look at it. If you come from outside of Europe, especially where the, the, your bachelor's degrees or, or programs may be four years in length or sometimes even five years. So finally, this person is also asking, and we've already kind of discussed that, but what are the, the a number of things that you look at for, for a, successfully, a successful applicant? You know what? What you, you have your GPA. You can't do so much about your GPA when you when you make your application, right? Your GPA is already fixed, or you can't change your GPA. Uh, but what can you do to improve your chances uh, of of getting an admission offer, Craig? If you you look at the GPA, yes. But we have also talked about the statement of purpose and how important that is. And that is one part. Do you have any kind of recommendation? for students with a maybe they have a slightly mediocre GPA, but they still want to be, you know, that we want to consider their applications. Yeah, I think Ulf summed it up perfectly right at the start of the, the hour when he said you need to stick out somehow. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't be if I was a candidate for applicant, I wouldn't be ashamed to to try to self promote yourself, right? Use the statement's purpose as a selling document, because that's basically what it is. You're, taking your characteristics, why you think you're a good candidate for the program and, and letting us know why. Tell us what you've done, but also, as Nadia said earlier, let us know what your intentions are for the future also. Right, so this is a, a document to take serious. It's not just something you can write in five minutes, perhaps. So you, you need to yeah. sit down and think about it and do your homework, I guess, about the programs and program content. Uh, but I want to speak, we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, I want to speak about like outcomes and, and what students can hope to get out of successfully taking your respective programs. Uh, if we start with uh, Nadia, uh, I graduate from your program, what can I do? 
Yeah, so uh, it's very common that you either work as a management consultant, maybe a business ad analyst, or uh, we have IT consultants, for instance, uh, to be uh, to start as a project leader in an organization, and then uh, also um, climb and maybe become a, a middle or senior manager uh, in a company. is also common. It could be that you're a strategy expert in uh, in a company or uh, that you work with HR, I would also say it's very common. Also, people with HR background can come to to this program. And then, of course, we shouldn't forget some people also continue as researchers. We haven't uh, talked that much about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, we have hardly mentioned it at all. But uh, we have two researchers here at uh, our department that comes from the MEM program, if not more, maybe two or three. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. And I, I, I do agree. We haven't talked about that, but we haven't received any questions about it either. So I, I don't feel so guilty that the topic hasn't no, no, come no. up. <laughs> <It's not on laughs> <you>. But OK, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, Niklas, what, your graduates, what do they do typically after they uh, graduate from the program? Oh, uh, well, it's difficult to say. There are so many places they end up. But mm. uh, of course, we're talking about fine finance specialist positions uh, or accounting uh, specializations of various kinds. So going into auditing firms, uh, either into transaction advisory, perhaps going towards auditing, not necessarily that common though, uh, or going to for investment banking, corporate finance advisory, corporate advisory, financial analysis. We have a lot of students ending up as analysts of various kinds. Analysts, consultants, I would say, are probably the two most common. Um, so, but finance and accounting specializations of various kinds. Mm. That's where our students go. Treasury would also be a fairly common place to go for controlling departments. OK, thank you. Ulf, uh, International Strategic Management, what do graduates do after they finish their program? I'm happy to say that they decide that by themselves. Um, so it's really very much up to you where you want to go uh, and that you have a quite uh, nice door to, to enter. I would say uh, I mean, we have examples for, from uh, global uh, businesses as Tetra Pak and IKEA and that kind of stuff. But also lots of people go into the German car industry. We have Google. Uh, consultancy industry of course so so it's but it's really up to you i would say uh finalizing the program and looking into to the future what i know is that many of my students already have unemployment uh they have precisely started and i know that they are after three years they enter a lot of uh, earn a lot of money around uh, six day to to seven thousand us dollars so so it's they are well paid it's but it's up to you to choose i would say yeah, obviously, yes. Uh, good investment, anyway. Uh, Craig, you have lots of entrepreneurs, and it's... yeah, they become um, entrepreneurs and change makers. Uh, basically, they we have a large proportion of our graduates and alumni who continue with their startup projects and run their startup projects, but they also we also have others who enter the world of employment. It could be in global multinationals, as Ulf mentioned, Tetra Pak and Volvo and things like this. IKEA also. But also they enter smaller companies or they work for government authorities who help support entrepreneurship either here in Sweden or in their home country. And I think one really cool thing that happens is quite often, because we've got such a diverse group of people from different um, previous studies, they often combine their previous studies with entrepreneurship mm. um, and go back to their, their original area but bring um, new thoughts and ideas with entrepreneurship along with it. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, actually, uh, our time is up. Uh, it's three minutes, uh, three minutes past three in the afternoon here in Central European time. I want to thank all the panelists, Niklas, Ulf, Craig and Nadja for uh, taking the time today to help us uh, or sh shed some light on their programs and what students can expect if they make an application and, uh, and successfully complete the program. So thank you very much for joining us. And also all the participants coming from all over the world, I, I would guess. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and I wish you the best of your or best of luck with your application if you decide to apply to 
Lund University School of Economics and Management program uh, for next year. So thanks, guys, and I hope to see you again uh, maybe next year. Uh, one year from now, we will have a similar session. All right, thank you for participating today. <laughs>